People, are we just gonna sit here and do nothing? We're this close to our metagame dying at the hands of a broken character just like Brawl in Smash 4. Sakurai and the devs at least tried to balance everyone else's movesets, but he gets a bunch of cracked out abilities all to himself, can recover from anywhere, and can practically kill you at any percent whenever he feels like it. He's not even playing the same game as the rest of us. That's why we need to ban Hero now before his update drops and he kills Ultimate. Footage unrelated. Okay, jokes aside, the competitive community's been up in arms lately, which happens a lot, but this time it's all about two characters in particular. Steve and Kazuya, especially the former, have been racking up results lately with upset wins on some of the game's best and brightest. This has spurred a vocal part of the community to say we need to seriously consider banning them before they become so oppressive that no one wants to compete anymore. Needless to say, emotions are running high and there's much more going on here than it seems. I may just be a mid-level player, but I've been involved in the Smash community for nearly 15 years now. I know, I know, I'm old, and I've seen so many meta shifts happen in real time that I can put whatever veteran experience I actually have to use. Let's get to the bottom of where the pro-ban argument is coming from, how legitimate it might be, and what got us into this mess to begin with. That last part's important, you'll see. So, first things first, what's behind all the ban talk? Ever since offline tournaments got going again, we've had multiple shakeups in Ultimate's metagame, most of it being a rise in results for DLC characters. This was a point of contention when it happened in Smash 4, and still is now, thanks to cynical theories that DLC fighters are made overpowered on purpose to force people to pay up to keep up. This has reached a boiling point recently, with two DLC characters who are also polarizing and unconventional by Smash standards. Seeing Steve and Kazuya, especially the former, come out of seemingly nowhere and take them out of by storm has dredged up painful memories for some people. Prior Smash titles have always had problems with a small set of characters at the top all but gatekeeping everyone else, but Brawl and Smash 4 are famous for having one character dominate competitive play, with the other top tiers fighting over scraps. You see, the pro ban crowd isn't acting out of salt or laziness, they're acting out of fear. Fear that the community is going to get crushed underfoot again by weird characters who cost extra money to use and don't play by the rules. Fear that a bunch of no-name players could pick them up and coast to big wins without having to put in the work everyone else is. Fear that it might already be happening. Since the last couple games wound up over-centralized after a while, they're afraid that history is repeating itself. That unless we start enacting bans now, Steve and or Kazuya will become such a monumental problem that competitors will decide it's not worth it anymore, stop playing, and the community will die. And I understand, anxiety is one hell of a driving force. When you believe you're staring oblivion in the face, you want to do something to stop it no matter what collateral damage might happen. But what if I told you things aren't as dire as they seem? For all the talk of Steve and Kazuya taking over the meta, their results haven't actually lined up with that so far. When overpowered characters in past games got going, they put a stranglehold on the meta in ways we simply have not seen yet. For those who weren't around for Brawl, things got so bad that it was normal for top 8 placements in Majors to be at least half Meta Knight mains. Compared to Ultimate Majors this year, where Steve has almost always had one spot at most in top 8, the only recent one to have two had several top players absent, and CEO last month had none. And Kazuya? His best results have come from a couple top players using him as a secondary. Looking at CEO again, Riddles pulled him out for just three games in top eight, and he lost two of them. But that's just top results. What about overall representation? Once Brawl and Smash 4's dominant characters took hold, more and more players changed over to them because they felt they had to in order to keep up. Brawl's meta eventually became Meta Knight plus the few characters he didn't hard counter, and Smash 4 saw more and more Bayonetta and Cloud as time went on, culminating in an EVO Grand Finals featuring a Bayo Ditto where both players responded to a hostile crowd by wasting everyone's time, a set that has somehow aged worse since. This kind of shift simply has not happened so far in Ultimate. Some top players have dabbled with Steven Kazuya, but very few have actually stuck with them, and mainly out of personal preference. In fact, despite all the fears of us repeating Smash 4, Steve isn't even number one in results so far this year, and Kazuya hasn't even hit top 15. 
But wait, you may be thinking, even if they haven't been dominant yet, the lack of online play from 2020 to late 21 means their players haven't even reached their full potential yet. I've seen this argument brought up sometimes, and it overlooks something. While the pandemic has delayed the meta development of every Fighter's Pass 2 character and their players are still figuring new things out, it means there's been just as little time for counterplay to develop. This is more anecdotal, but it says something that during Yanni and Akala's run at the Gimvitational, hopefully I pronounced those right, multiple Discord groups I'm in had multiple members noticing things their opponents, including the top players, were doing wrong as they happened. And if a bunch of people who aren't at that level were noticing glaring mistakes in real time, it means there's still a lot of room for counterplay to grow. While it's still technically possible Steve and Kazuya could become more dominant a year or two or three from now, signs so far are not pointing toward it being inevitable, and we really shouldn't make snap decisions that risk fracturing the community based on something that might happen. But it goes deeper than that. This may be the current crisis, but it's far from the first. Why does the Smash community have such a habit of jumping to conclusions? Remember, this is not the first time in Ultimate's history that people have called for preemptive bans. Late last year, players were sounding the alarm after Pyra and Mithra pulled off some big results and had multiple top players picking them up as a secondary. There was talk of them being the next Smash 4 Cloud, a borderline broken character allegedly easy enough for anyone to do well with after minimal practice, and they were going to force the metagame to revolve around them. Fast forward several months, and not only has that not happened, their results have fallen off a little because more players are figuring out the matchup and applying counterplay. And let's not forget the vocal minority who wanted Joker banned back when Leo was destroying everyone with him, or the backlash toward Rob once he and his Touch of Death gyro setups started getting the most results of anyone for a while, or that time when some people really did want Hero banned before he was even playable because everything shown off in his presentation had them convinced the RNG in his moveset would turn matches into complete luck of the draw. That intro joke was a real thing. Even though none of these came to pass, proponents were utterly convinced these fighters were going to break the metagame like Brawl Meta Knight and Smash 4 Bayonetta, and every time their fears were unfounded and counterplay was found. But that counterplay isn't always obvious or intuitive. The Steve matchup involves a lot of knowledge checks that can take stocks early if you don't know how they work and how to avoid them, and that knowledge ain't easy to find if you don't already know it's there. Fighting Kazuya correctly involves camping him out using whatever tools you have for that and playing to not get hit so he never gets a chance to get his big combos going, which runs against the mindset of a Western player base who, with few exceptions, thinks there are only two ways to fight, rush down and wrong. Most of this stuff goes over the heads of low-level players that make up so much a competitive smash because they don't understand it or don't even realize the tactics are there in the first place. That's what I think the get good talk is missing. It's not that these people don't want to learn the counterplay, they're afraid it doesn't exist. And that's because the Smash community low-key kinda sucks at teaching fundamentals. Some videos are out there, but we as a player base put so much focus on tech skill and big combos, probably a carryover from Melee, that we neglect to actually help new players understand core fighting game concepts and strategies. The lack of fundies makes it so much harder for them to understand exactly why they're getting bodied, so they assume the characters they see kicking ass and taking names must be game breakers like the stories they heard about Bayo or Meta Knight. But it goes even deeper than that. It's always interesting to see how each newcomer gets adapted into Smash's environment. Some feel like natural fits, some require dynamic changes and creative liberties, but it all serves the purpose of helping them stand out in an ever-growing roster. But the more Smash has gone on, more often we've seen fighters designed to feel like they walked right out of their home series, with physics, movesets, and mechanics directly lifted from the source material. When done carefully, it can lead to some really unique designs. However, lately there's been a trend of newcomers so focused on this that it feels like Sakurai and the devs didn't double check how well it meshed with a platform fighter environment, or how they'd feel to fight against. Having Steve mine for materials to build stuff and create blocks at will is cool design, but did the stuff he crafts need to be so powerful with so little material cost? And did he need the ability to act so soon after placing a block that he can extend combos far beyond what was intended? Does Kazuya really need to be so polarizing that he destroys people in one or two combos but struggles hard against anything that can outspace him or wall out his crouch dashes, or gains such ridiculous reward from Electric Wind God Fist with so little risk that his entire playstyle revolves around it more than it does in Tekken? 
And it's not just them. Did Mithra really need her foresight ability brought in on top of everything else? Did Min Min really need to be able to supercharge her dragon arm after throwing someone and gain the ability to kill super early off stage simply because her arm worked that way in arms? Did Hero really need to revolve so much around the concept of RNG and RPGs that sometimes he has to steal a stock through sheer luck just to keep up? And this is a reason why Smash 4 Bayo was the terror she was. The devs focused so hard on adapting her source material that checking to make sure it wasn't overtuned became lower priority. And some characters have ended up worse off because of this. Did Hero also need to carry over the act of reading through menus and RPGs to find the spell you want so closely that playing in a language other than the player's native one becomes a serious hurdle for Hero mains traveling abroad? This is one of the few actual issues I have with Ultimate. Newcomers so focused on celebrating their games that their actual game feel, especially when fighting against them, plays second fiddle. Which has left us with some characters who, while not broken, have wound up utterly toxic to play against. Hopefully the next Smash game, whenever it happens, is able to learn from this. Because sometimes, showing some restraint can lead to a better gaming experience. Or at least one less prone to controversies like this. So in summary, while this dreadful duo, especially Steve, have been making waves lately, neither has reached a point yet of causing legitimate damage to the metagame. And while we haven't seen the full extent of their potential yet, we haven't seen counterplay to them fully develop either. The pro band crowd is acting out of fear and anxiety, not laziness. And a big part of that fear is because fighting against these two can be counterintuitive to players who don't have strong fundamentals. And a big reason why we're in this mess to begin with is because several newcomers lately have been laser focused on being a direct rip from their source material without making sure it's well balanced or not infuriating to play against. As you can see, the truth is more complicated and less terrifying than it seems. So can we not jump to conclusions? Before we start seriously throwing band talk around, let's take a step back and see if they actually become serious problems first, so we don't end up splitting the community in two and alienating entire player bases for reasons that end up not being real. I know getting the Smash community to listen can be a fool's errand. Like I said, I've been here a long time, but it's worth a shot. Hey, if you're still around and this video entertained you, check out my other content. I have a signature series where I build carefully crafted, and hopefully not toxic, movesets for characters who aren't in Smash yet. I got one for Zoroark coming soon too, so uh, keep an eye out for it. Special thanks to these people for help making this video happen. Thanks to my patrons as well for their continued support, even with how crazy things get in this fandom sometimes. So, until next time, may you overcome whatever challenges await, whether iron tools, iron fists, or something else entirely.